Hi everyone, Eric here. Today, we are going to learn how to build a three-statement financial model in Microsoft Excel. The income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. How to connect them and what they really mean. Okay, let's get started. Okay, let's talk about each of these three financial statements and what they are and what they represent. So first off, the income statement and the cash flow statements are flow statements, meaning they represent periods of time, whereas the balance sheet represents one specific moment in time. So the income statement tells us how much money we made and the expenses related to those sales, but the cash flow, it's missing many things. For instance, changes in what you owe and what you own. So if we raised debt, if we raised growth investments, things like this, you would never see that on the income statement. You would only see that on the balance sheet and then you would convert the balance sheet into a flow statement, which is actually what the cash flow statement is. So you need each of these three statements to get the full picture of what the company actually looks like and how it's doing. So in order to build this three statement financial model, we need to first build the income statement and we are going to leave depreciation and interest blank because those we have to calculate from the balance sheet. Next, we're gonna create a capex and depreciation schedule and those are basically just the assets that we are buying and how we depreciate them over time. Step three is build the balance sheet based off of historical numbers and based off the capex. And then finally, we need to build a cash flow statement and tie it back to the balance sheet so that our balance sheet actually balances. This is usually the trickiest part of building the model. So first, let's get started building the income statement. All income statements, we need to start with assumptions. So what kind of business do we have? And really, what are we doing here? So let's create an assumption section and start. So we will obviously have revenue. Let's see, revenue and so we're going to use an uh, example of a business I used in a previous lecture, which is a subscription-based coffee company. So you, you basically sign up to buy coffee and we send it to you in the mail. And so we'll use those basic numbers. So to calculate our revenue, we would of course need average order value. We need refunds as a percentage of revenue, discounts. Okay, so everything else will be a percentage of revenue. Um, so let's say our new customers, and remember, when you're doing this, you always want to put this stuff in blue. So any assumption hard-coded number, if it's not a formula, you put it in blue when you're doing financial modeling. So new customers, let's say 75,000 for the first year. Okay, so we start at 75,000, and then, okay, subsequent years, let's say we go to 120,000. Then we go to 250,000 and then 450,000. Okay, great. Next, average order value. So the average order value we're going to say for you know each of these orders is $40. And we can just say that that never changes. Next, refunds as a percentage of revenue. Okay, so if we're going to put in a percentage of revenue here, we're going to say 5%. And then discounts as a percentage of revenue, let's say 8%. So then if we have the revenue, we can easily calculate those numbers. Next, we will have cost of goods sold. And the things that we'll need to calculate that are product, fulfillment, and merchant services, let's say. So product basically represents, okay, what percent of revenue it goes to basically just buying the coffee itself, let's say 35%. Next we have fulfillment, which is let's say 5% and merchant services. This is what we pay the credit card companies, 3%. So these are all percentages of revenue and we'll be able to calculate the cost of goods sold from that. And finally, you have your operating expenses and let's say we have personnel and that is mm, let's say 20 percent of revenue and next we have marketing and let's say that's 10 percent of revenue and finally some kind of other category that's five percent of revenue and so with all of this we should be able to calculate most of the things on the income statement there's a couple other important categories depreciation 
but we need to get this from our other model. So we will be linking this back in in the minutes to come. Interest, so this is interest payments um, on any outstanding debt you have, and this will also actually be from the other model because we don't have uh, the amount of debt yet. And then finally, we'll have to have some kind of tax rate. So um, tax rate, and the, debt, the tax rate currently in the United States right now is 21%. So I'll just put that in there for the tax rate. Okay, so up to now, we have all the assumptions to make a pretty simple income statement. Insert some rows here, get some space. And we obviously start the income statement itself with just a revenue section. Revenue, make a bold, put an underline, and then we'll have gross revenue, and then we can sort of steal some of these categories from down below. Um, refunds, discounts, so we'll control C, control V. And I'll just take that out here. And then we'll have net revenue, which we'll put in bold. And okay, so gross revenue will just be orders times the price, which is the average order value. And so that's easy enough. So here, let's put a dollar format on that. And for refunds, it'll be basically, you know, whatever our assumption says, it's 5% of revenue. But remember, put a negative sign, revenue times, asterisk, the 5%. And in this case, I wanna put a dollar sign in front of the five. Why? That means in this formula, I will lock that row so that I can copy this formula to other rows, but that particular row won't change. Okay, let me show you what I mean. So let's put a, some commas in this. And let's say I wanna copy this down one row. So I do Control C and then I do Control V. What happened? This row continued to be locked on row five. So that's what I mean. So if I highlight this, hit Control C, Shift, right arrow three times, control V. Now I have the full section. Now I want to put a bottom border on this. And now I can sum up the net revenue. Okay, so our net revenue is 2.6 million. And then it goes up and up and up. And next let's move on to the cost of goods sold. Bold. And now we can go steal some of these names just from down below. Control C, copy that. And these, these are basically exactly the same. So we're gonna take, in this case, net revenue, not the gross revenue, and lock the row. But I can hit F4 multiple times and toggle through different kinds of locks. So I'm looking for the dollar sign just in front of the eight. Got it, that's all right there. And you can see now that I can just copy this formula. It references the revenue every single time and it works great. So in this case, control C, shift, right arrow, control V. And now if I wanna put the bottom border, hit alt, that brings up the menu. Then I can hit H, that brings up the home tab. Now you see this B here where the borders are, hit B. And now I can just hit the letter associated with whatever I want. I want the bottom border, O, so I'll just hit O. And then you'll see I've got a bottom border. So that's a little trick. Using Excel without the mouse makes you really, really fast. And it's basically the only way to survive um, if you have a really rigorous Excel job. Uh, if you're going to do something like banking or venture capital or something like this, you need to be really, really fast. So gross margin now is of course revenue minus cost of goods sold. So revenue minus cost of goods sold. Let's put the fancy top and double bottom border on this. And then we can even show a percent, a gross margin percent here. So that's just the gross margin divided by revenue, just so we can see, okay, what, you know, what percent at the product level uh, are we making in profit in terms of our revenue? So you can see it's flat every year. And then finally, we'll have the operating expenses. Again, bold. Um, what are all of our costs down here? We've got personnel, marketing, other, depreciation, 
copy this back up above. For personnel, we're going to take the net revenue and we're going to multiply it by our assumption. And again, don't forget to put a dollar symbol in front of the row. Great. So now we've got all of this. We can just copy the, the formula because we organized our model very, very nicely. And for depreciation, depreciation represents the expenses of things that we bought in the past. This is actually something we count, we calculate on the balance sheet and on the CapEx schedule. So we will get this number later on once we have calculated it. But at this point, we don't know what it is and there's no way for us to calculate it. So now we have the total OPEX here. Again, I wanna put the bottom border. You can see I just did that with a keyboard shortcut and it's already there really fast. And so we've got total OPEX operating operating income. Again, another important metric, which is the gross margin minus total OPEX. And again, this is not our real operating income because we're missing depreciation, but we will get that filled in momentarily here. And then here we're gonna have our interest payments. Interest, again, this is something we need to calculate based on how much debt we have. We're gonna be paying an interest based on our outstanding debt. We don't know what that is yet. So now we have net interest before, net income before taxes. So this will be operating income minus interest. And you'll see, okay, why do we have the second metric? Well, because you actually pay taxes on your net income after you pay the interest. So the, the, the interest sort of shields you from taxes, which is something very interesting about interest, which is that there's sort of an incentive to take on debt. So now we calculate our taxes, tax rate 21%. Okay, we've got the model all set up. And finally, just two last things here, um, or maybe three, let's say, net income, um, net income percent, and just for fun, let's throw in EBITDA, because that's a very important kind of private equity metric. And so we have net income before taxes minus taxes, then we take our net income, divided by our net revenue, and we're gonna get some percent. So I can copy this forward, I can you know, put some, some different formats on this, make this bold, and then our EBITDA is our operating income plus our depreciation. Obviously, again, we can't really see it right now, but this is sort of a, a cash flow proxy. People a lot of times compare this number to how much debt a company has to try to see, okay, can this company pay off its debt? Can it have more debt? Should it have less debt? So it's, it's, a, it's an important metric as well. So now let's jump to the CapEx and depreciation schedule. So what is the CapEx and depreciation schedule? This is the area where we show any assets that we're gonna buy throughout the year, any equipment, software, physical stuff, and then we also calculate the depreciation. And depreciation is where we basically take the cost of the asset and we put it on the income statement over the, the useful lifetime of the object. So if we buy something for $100,000 in cash, but we can use it for five years, we put 100,000 divided by five, which is 20,000, every year on the income statement so that we match the expense with the actual asset. So here's what I mean. First off, we need to create a section that says useful life in years. So that will that will help us here calculating the depreciation. So we have our CapEx, and that just means asset purchases. So let's say for our business, <clears throat> we are going to need to buy some servers, we're gonna to need to buy some custom software, maybe we have someone build it for us, and then finally for our warehouse, we're gonna to need to buy a forklift, and that'll be our total CapEx here and we can put some of these nice formats on it. And so then, so 
Then you need to estimate, okay, how long can I actually use this asset? Okay, first off we have servers, let's say they're good for five years, and then we have custom software, you know, we think we can use that for three years, and then a forklift for six years, it lasts a long time. And then over here, let's put a dollar sign on uh, format on these numbers. Let's say we buy $75,000 of servers in year one, 50,000 of custom software in year one, and then 100,000 more, we need some more software in year two, and then 100,000 more in year three, and then finally we end up buying a forklift for $30,000 in year three. Now you're gonna calculate, okay, each year, what were our investments in assets, and in year four, we didn't need to buy any assets. Okay, this is gonna go straight onto the balance sheet, but we also need the depreciation, which is gonna go onto the income statement. So if we just copy what we have from above, and then we'll have total D and A. Usually it's called depreciation and amortization. Amortization is the depreciation of like an intellectual asset, so not a physical asset, but something that has value. Border on this. Okay, so here we have our depreciation. We have these servers, they cost $75,000, and I'm gonna hit F4. You'll see you lock the, the column and the row. And then we are going to divide that by five years. And again, I'm gonna hit F4, so we lock the cells. So we know that that's gonna cost us one year, two year, three year, four years. So at that point, it's four out of the five years have been accounted for, and we're just spreading the cost of our original investment over time so we can put it back on the income statement. Next, you have your custom software. So in year one, we have 50,000, and we know that that 50,000 is good for three years. Okay, and we have nothing else. So let's copy the format down here. And so we know in year one, it's gonna be 50,000. And so let's put this here. So now we get the 50,000 in the second year of its three years, but now we had another investment. So now we have 100,000 divided by three years. So they're both, the depreciation of both items is happening at the same time. And then in year three, we have an even more extreme thing where we have a third investment and the depreciation of that item is happening also at the same time. And finally, in year four, we have the depreciation of a few of the items, but now the first 50,000, three years have passed. So we know that's fully depreciated. So we're just depreciating the last two investments. And then finally, for the forklift, we know that's gonna be good for six years divided by six. Here, copy it over. So now you can see the sort of waterfall of depreciation that we need to calculate on top uh, of, of you know, rolling forward throughout all the years. Okay, so at this point we can tie the DNA back in, in into the income statement. So if we go back to the income statement and we hit equals and we come back to the capex, we can say, okay, you know, the DNA this year is 32,000. Let's, of course, fix the formats, take off the weird color, and then copy C, shift, right arrows, and then control V. So now we have this. So we actually can see our real operating income at this point. We can see our real EBITDA at this point. But in order to calculate the regular interest, we're going to need to go to the balance sheet. So you'll see in order to count, do a forecast of the balance sheet, we are gonna need the historical numbers. So here you'll see the assets. You'll see, okay, how much cash did we have in year zero, you know, at the end of last year? And then accounts receivable. Accounts receivable are things that people owe us and are going to pay us within less than one year. But for instance, let's say I gave you a service and I gave you an invoice and I said, okay, you have 60 days to pay me. If I haven't received the cash yet, I put that here, but it's, it's very similar to cash because you'll receive it soon. And then your fixed assets are the things that you own. So what we just calculated on the CapEx, you know, all the assets you buy and below minus the amount of depreciation that they have. So this shows you the net value. Okay, I bought it, you know, three years ago, but we've sort of depreciated it by half, so now it's worth less. And that's your total assets. So last year we had 4.4 million, 
and liabilities, you have accounts payable. This is like accounts receivable, but the opposite. This is where I owe someone money and I'm planning to pay them soon, but I haven't paid them yet. So I need to pay them in one year or less if it's in this account. Deferred revenue is basically when I sell someone a service, but I haven't given them the service yet. So you paid me you know, $10,000 to do ABC thing, but I haven't done it yet. I put that revenue here because I can't put it on the income statement because you need to match the, the revenue with whenever you do it. Long-term debt, we've got $3 million on the balance sheet. So that's the total liabilities, total things that, uh, that our company owes to someone else. Okay, next we have the common stock, and this is related to basically people investing in the company. This number is pretty meaningless if you look at like big public companies. It has to do with the original share price and some other things, but it doesn't really tell you much. Retained earnings are your net income from the balance from the income statement. And you basically add it up every year on the balance sheet. And the one thing you need to know is that liabilities plus shareholders equity, these two sections, if you add them together, it must equal the same as your assets. If these two numbers aren't the same, you're in big trouble and there's a mistake. And for that reason, we put a section called the balance check where we take the assets and we subtract liabilities plus equity. And this number should be zero. If it's not zero, you screwed something up. So always have this, always keep this in your mind. So now let's forecast the balance sheet. So start with revenue. Let's start with revenue. So, and let's just specify that this is net revenue. So the first things let's try to forecast are um, accounts receivable, and this is gonna be a percent of revenue. Um, accounts payable, percent of revenue, and deferred revenue. Um, deferred revenue. Again, these are, these are all just percentage of, of revenue and you know generally some percentage of your revenue people are going to owe you, you're going to owe other people. So revenue is really easy on this one. So let's put in some, some years here. So year one, two, three, four, copy. Let's just copy it in up here. And we want to calculate accounts receivable. So let's put in our revenue, let's link it in equals Let's go to the income statement. Where's our net revenue? There it is. Let's put a little format on it. Uh, I don't know if it needs to be. So wide, control C, copy it over, control V. So now you can see that um, you, you have your each year's revenue. Okay, and so accounts receivable. Let's say a, a reasonable number is 5% of revenue. At any given time, your clients are in the process of paying you and your accounts payable, I think this is the wrong blue. Yeah, I want a darker one. And your accounts payable, let's say 6%. So that's what you owe. You generally want your accounts payable to be higher. You wanna owe more money. You wanna basically have your clients pay you really fast, and then you wanna pay people slowly because then you get to keep more cash. So that's a kind of a rule of thumb. And deferred revenue, let's say it's like 3%. Um, okay, control C, control V. And let's say this deferred revenue is actually going up over time. We're selling some sort of long-term plan where we sell a bunch up front and then we give it to them over time. So um, this number is, let's say, going up 8 and then maybe even 10. And that would be a good business decision. So let's go up to accounts receivable. And in this case, we will say, okay, net revenue times 5% gives us an accounts receivable number, control C, control V. Um, and then, you know, we wanna sum this up. You can see this is summing, so we can just copy this over. And let, let's see here. Um, we wanna put a bottom border here. Let's take the, the dollar signs off. And so we've got accounts receivable. Now let's go down to accounts payable. So we can sort of just copy this, this format down below, makes it easy. Um, and so in the case of accounts payable, we want to just do the exact same thing. I'm just trying to take off the border here. 
So we take revenue, multiply it by accounts payable. And then in this case, we take revenue, multiply it again by the deferred revenue assumption. So in this case, all we just need to do is control C, control V. Okay, so we've got a chunk of our balance sheet forecasted. What's next? Next, we can look at um, fixed assets. Okay, so how many assets did we buy this year? Well, let's take the assets from last year and add to it the CapEx. We already calculated this. So we add the 125, then your total assets are 40 plus 125, 165. So you can just copy that over. And then our accumulated depreciation, it's negative because it's reducing the value. It's showing that the asset is losing value. So you take your negative 10,000 and then you subtract the depreciation. So you'll see this makes the value actually, um, the negative value higher and higher. So your net um, assets, the net value of your assets uh, is, is basically staying pretty flat because you're buying more but you're depreciating them. So this sort of shows you what the real value is. And then you'll have your total assets. Cash, we cannot calculate this number without making a cash flow statement. So we have to leave this empty. And again, you see all these statements are very connected. So you need to know how to do all three um, in order to make any of them. Next, long-term debt. So let's make some assumptions around our debt. So let's say we have basically net borrowing. So this is like new debt that we take on. Then we have our debt payments. Um, and then we have our interest rate, and then we have our interest payments, payments. Okay, great. So let's say these two numbers, we'll just put in, um, you know, some numbers that make sense here. So let's say we're paying like 600000 a year in debt payments. But in year two, we want to take on another $1.5 Let's see what that looks like. So we take our debt, we add new debt, which in this year it's zero, and we subtract debt payments. So you can see, okay, we paid off 600,000. Then in year two, okay, we added new debt, so probably our debt payment has to go up. It's probably gonna be, say, 900,000 now. Um, and so then probably for every year. So because what we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to have to pay this debt off over time with our cash flow. So debt's going down, then you see you have your total liability section. So this shows at any given time, year one, year two, year three, what do we own, what do we owe? Finally, common stock, we're just gonna do equal and then the previous cell. Let's just assume we're not taking on any new investments. So this number doesn't change unless you mess around with your with your ownership table. And then retained earnings. So this is really key. This is extremely important. You need to take last year's retained earnings and add your net income uh, of the year to it. Net income. If you do not do this, your balance sheet will not balance. It will never, ever, ever balance. So, just looking back at the income statement, I'm seeing our interest is still empty. So let's go down and finish up that part of it. So let's say our interest rate is, let's say it's 8%. That might be you know, an actual interest rate. And then 8% times however much debt we have. So we have, we have this much debt. So you know, we see it here again, you know, our debt's going down. So our interest is going down. So let's Let's link that into the income statement and get that finalized. Equals interest payment, take off the weird color, and now you can see our interest payment is totally done, finished, 100%. So that's our real net income. Then we have our balance sheet. We linked in the net income here in retained earnings. And so this shows you know, our earnings over time, how much earnings do we have, and we show it right there on the balance sheet. And then, you know, each year it goes up and up and up, of course, and your balance sheet will not balance mathematically unless you do that. So now, let's see, does our balance sheet balance? No, why not? Because 
we need the cash flow statement in order to calculate the cash. After we forecast the cash flow statement, the balance sheet will balance and this number will be zero. So let's go to the cash flow statement. Okay, every cash flow statement begins with net income. And you start with net income and then you basically adjust it for changes in the balance sheet which were not on the income statement. So first things first, let's start with net income. So you put that at the top and then, you know, put a nice format on it. And then you will start with your operating activities. So what are your operating activities? You have um, depreciation. And first off, we're going to have a section for operating activities, a section for investing activities. So investing activities are assets that you buy. And then we're going to have financing activities. So these are like any debt or equity you raise. So this is just related to running your business. This is stuff that you buy, and this is money you raise. So the, the cash flow statement is split into these three sort of sections so you can see you can see what's going on in the business. So depreciation, change in AR, accounts receivable, change in accounts payable, change in deferred rev, and that's going to be your operating cash flow. So first off, we need to figure out, okay, we have this depreciation going in the income statement, but it's not actually cash. It's actually just a, a kind of a made up expense, whereas the cash already went out. So we first take the depreciation, go back to the CapEx schedule and grab the depreciation and put it on this thing. So we've got our depreciation. Let's copy that forward. Next, change in accounts receivable. So we go to the balance sheet. We say, okay, what's our balance in accounts receivable last year? What's minus our balance in accounts receivable this year? Okay, it's negative 10,000. Why? Because people owe us more money now than they did last year. So it's negative for our cash. So we can just copy that forward. Change in accounts payable. Let's go down to the balance sheet. This is the opposite. What do we owe people compared to what do we owe them last year? 81,000. It's because we haven't paid them and that number has grown. So that's actually positive for our cash. And deferred revenue is exactly the same. So we can even just copy that down one because we know that deferred revenue is right below accounts payable. Okay, so now we have our operating cash flow. So what we do is we basically total all of this. We take our net income and then we add all of this to it. So you can see it's um, 432,000 and this is, this is how much cash our company is basically making. But now let's look at, okay, what did we actually buy? CapEx, those are investments in fixed assets. So in this case, we just link in, okay, you know, we spent $125,000 in year one, and you know, every year we spent some money, but not in year four. And this actually gives you your free cash flow, which is, you know, the business, the cash from your operations minus any assets you bought. So here's your free cash flow. And then finally you have your financing activities. So, you know, you have your debt repayment. So that's going to be cash um, that goes away, but then you have your net borrowings. So that's going to be money you borrowed. So that's going to be an increase in cash. And then, you know, cash flow from financing. So let's look here, debt repayment. debt repayment so we can just link this in but remember make it negative because that's negative cash and I'm pulling it out of the assumption section but these two repayment and borrowing they're in the same account on the balance sheet so I can use one account or I can split it into two and then in this case net borrowing 
is going to be just any new cash that came onto our balance sheet. So you'll see that net cash flow from financing, every year we have cash going out because we're paying our debt, but in this one year we have cash coming in because we're borrowing. So finally we have our net cash flow, the total amount of money or actual cash money that went that our business produced this year. So we have our free cash flow plus net cash flow. So in the first year it's actually negative, but we had a big cash balance, so we should be fine. And then it turns positive. So here's how we tie this into the balance sheet. First off, I wanna just freeze this pane, and then we go to the balance sheet, we take cash from the previous year, and then we add to it net cash flow. If we did everything correctly, correctly and I'm praying right now, our balance sheet should balance. Oh, look at that. Incredible. So copy, copy it over. You can take the formats off this. Look down again. Wow. Balance sheet is balanced. Assets equal liabilities plus equity in every year. This means you calculated everything correctly. So a couple more points, troubleshooting. The biggest problem that you're gonna have building these models is that your balance sheet does not balance because balance sheets can look really different depending on what kind of company it is. So here's a little checklist of things to double check to see if you have a problem to try to find it. Is your net income linked to the retained earnings? Yes or no? It should be yes. Is your cash flow, your net cash flow linked to cash? It should obviously be yes. Have you included all of your balance sheet accounts in your cash flow statement? If you forgot to put accounts receivable in your cash flow statement, your balance sheet will not balance. So do not forget an account, and the longer the balance sheet, the longer the cash flow statement. Do your historical financials balance. Does this historical year balance? If this thing never balances, then you'll never get any year afterwards to balance. So those are some tricks for, for troubleshooting. So that's it. In this video, we learned how to build an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. If you like this content, please subscribe to my channel, like this video, leave me a comment. It would really help me out and I'll keep making content like this. And if you wanna learn more about Microsoft Excel, check out my discounted course links below. I released some courses, would love to see you there and keep learning together. Thank you for your time.